I am so pleased to have as my co-presenter today a lady who is a dear friend of mine for many years, but more importantly for you, one of the country's leading experts on notary law and practice, and especially uh, in the corporate setting. Uh, Kelsia Cannon, who is with me, has been a notary uh, for almost 30 years, uh, and most importantly, for more than a decade, she has been the individual in the United States who, who supervises the largest number of notaries. Uh, she has something like 450 notaries um, who she supervises in how many states? 30, 38. In 38 states of the country. Uh, she, <laughs> yes. Um, so here we go. Uh, the right. floor is yours. So we wanted to have a conversation about some of the things that we get a lot of questions about. Um, and I think the first thing to remember is that most notaries are full or part-time employees of employers. More than four million notaries in the United States are employee notaries, meaning that they became notaries to assist their employers, right? Um, which is not something you would think then there would be more out there for employee notaries, and there really is not. So. First and foremost, start with your state statutes. But I wanted to quick tell you a little story, and I was just mentioning this to Michael. I became an employee notary when I was 19 years old because my boss wanted me to have a not you know, be a commission so that I could help him out. 19 years old, this is before the internet. Yes, I am dating myself. Don't take that anywhere. Um, but when I did that, right, there was no class. I got a little half-page pamphlet from my state, said go get a stamp and knock yourself out. But even at 19, I thought, I'm signing my name on something. There should be more to this. Shouldn't there be somebody to tell me what I'm supposed to be doing here? And I couldn't find anything. And I wasn't, I was a notary for probably six or seven years before I finally got my first notary training. And I was so excited. And I remember sitting in that notary class, going very pale, saying, they're going to put me in jail forever. I am never going to get out. This is a trap. And then just by chance, a police car went by the room with its lights on. I thought, yep, that's it. I'm done. Once I got over the conviction that I was going to be arrested and sent to jail forever, then I was mad. I was really angry that I was not told this. And it was upsetting to me that neither my employer nor my commissioning body, my state, would tell me that I was financially and personally liable for what I notarized, that if I didn't do it correctly. OK, well, what's correctly? There's no class. There's no pamphlet. You didn't even give me a little sheet of paper. What do you mean? So since then, I have been an absolute advocate for getting training, making sure companies do this, and making sure companies build programs for their notaries that are starting with their notaries first and the company's second, which is, raises a lot of eyebrows. Um, but it's, that's why it's important, because it's the notary. A $100,000 lawsuit to a notary is a completely different thing to a $100,000 lawsuit to a, no, an employer, right? So let's start there. First of all, with notaries and their employers, they should always start with state or territorial notary statutes and regulations. That is where you start. The problem is, that employers think that because they monitor and they're responsible for your work, right, that they can do that as part of your notaries. They're not the boss when it comes to notaries. You're not commissioned through your company. You're commissioned through your state or your territory or your group that you have commissioned through. So you have to be able to separate that out. And that's what employers don't understand. It's not the same thing. That's where this becomes, starts getting into problems. Problem, of course, too, is the state statutes don't do a great job, right? Have any, how many of you have taken Michael's amazing when the statutes are silent class? Amazing, right? It's true, right? I'm here to tell you. I've had in 38 states. They're completely different. And half the time, all 38 don't discuss any of these things. And you're like, <laughs> Could we have some basic? No, doesn't yeah. work that way. Actually, 
if, if you read your notary statute, uh, you'll be hard pressed to find any reference anywhere to an employer of a notary. Uh, there is just, there, there's little about notarization itself, but almost nothing, uh, zero in lots of states uh, referring to the employer or a notary as an employee. It's, it's really um, I think a, a that's big on gap. purpose too, but that's just a pet theory. I can't prove it. Finally, the last part, if notaries and their employers do not adhere to their best practices, they are at risk. There are notary lawsuits that happen every day. They're not as common for basic business notarizations for employee notaries, not quite as common. But there are lots of people in positions where they're more at risk than others. That's where we're, we've got to find that balance. So sometimes if you're just doing all you do as far as your notarizations are the state commission forms where the state form doesn't even commit, you know, comply with its own state statutes, I love those, um, probably not as big a risk. But if you're in it, we have, I work for Ameriprise Financial, we have advisor offices all over the country. If you're in an advisor office and somebody's doing their entire estate planning, there are a lot of contentious documents in that. And if you're the one doing those notarizations, I hope you know what you're doing, right? So it's a little different. But again, this really, yeah, people didn't really talk about it, it wasn't a big deal until the robo-signing lawsuit. Remember the one? $25 billion lawsuit. <laughs> now, a bunch of lawyers in the country Four said, how much money can you really get out of a notary? $100,000 maybe, bankrupt them, eh, you know, not a big deal. But, oh wait, I can go after the employer of the notary? They all did the Scooby-Doo. You know what the Scooby-Doo is? Arr! Oh, now we're talking. And do they have a lot of compunction about going through the notary to get to the employer? No. That's why it's important. So, fundamental principles that the statutory authorized lawfully commissioned public official is the notary, not the employer. That the employer controls the employment, but the notary performs and controls the performance of the notarizations. Huge, right? Now, we're gonna give you best practices based on what we have seen and what our experience is. Okay, you may have another opinion. There are a couple of places where he and I have different opinions. I love those. And, and we, we are not agents of National Notary Association. These are our views, not necessarily those of the National Notary Association. And I, I guess we haven't said, um, um, of course, if we advise you to do something that violates what your statute says, you, you abide by your state law. We are here to suggest what the best practices uh, should be for you to follow where there is a, a gap or an absence of law uh, that covers the, the service or activity that's involved. All right, so let's get into some can-do, can-do. And what we wanna give you is some practical things to take back for yourself, but also any other notaries and your employers, right? To give them some good, good best practices. But also, my hope is, that as I told you, I was really angry when I came out of that training going, why am I not told that? My daughter gave me a t-shirt a couple of years ago. It says, if you throw me to the wolves, I will come back leading the pack. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you guys become my wolf pack. Let's all go back to our notary uh, employers. You can have a good conversation with them and let's see if we can get some better understanding between notaries and their employers to both benefit. All right, and I know Here's where we go. Can and should refuse directives or requests to perform notarizations in violation of notary law or best practice, even if requested to do so by an employer or a supervisor. That is the number one question I get asked. It is very difficult conversation to go to the person who may decide whether or not you need to show up to work tomorrow or not to say no to them. I get people that come to me all the time where now they've taken notary training. They've been doing notarizations for their boss for years. Then they take notary training. 
And then they've got to go back to their boss and say, yeah, remember that I've been doing for you all these years? I can't do that anymore. In some cases, the, notar the employer's like, oh, gosh, I didn't know that. Oh, yes, absolutely. Let's work together. Let's make this right. I would love to say that all of them are like that. No. Some of them flip their heads. I mean, they lose it. And so our program was designed for the notaries first and the company second. Why? Because if you protect the notaries, you will protect the company. Okay? But there needs to be somebody in the middle sometimes of that conversation where you could say, I know I would totally do it for you, but she won't let me. Do you see what I'm saying? So there has to sometimes be a buffer. If there is no buffer, then you're going to have to be able to have that conversation. And so I'm going to give you some tips on how to have that conversation with your employer if you need to, because it is scary. The first thing I'm going to tell you is do it now. Have the conversation before they ask you to do something you can't do, right? Talk to them. Say, look, I went to this training. And here's some things I learned, and I think it's in our best interest, and you could be liable as well, and so let's, let's talk about what we can and can't do and some best practices. That is a much better conversation than right then, especially maybe they have clients or somebody standing right there and you're trying to say no, right? So tell them, talk to them about all the things that are important when you're talking about what you can and can't do. And I wrote it down because I don't want to forget anything. <laughs> Speak about the signer must be present at the time of the notarization in almost every case. That's really important. If there is maybe three things that I see the most lawsuits for employee notaries on, it's, this is one of them. This is a huge one that the signer was not present. And if you don't think it matters, I met a lady in Wisconsin when I was doing a training there who said, I've worked for this man for 10 years. His practice was he would sign something that needed to be notarized. I worked for him. I know his signature. He'd drop it on my desk because I left earlier than he did. He'd drop it on his, my desk. And then in the morning when I got in earlier than he did, I'd notarize it and then drop it on his desk. She knew his signature, she knew who he was, right? Except the guy turned out to be perpetrating a fraud. And he knew that if he dropped it on her desk, she would notarize it. She didn't ask questions. Was his signature, guess what? When the fraud was discovered, she lost her house, she lost her retirement savings, and she barely, when you know, was in real financial trouble and was horrified. Now, I would like to think that he didn't realize that he was putting her in that situation, but if you're going to perpetrate a fraud, it's hard to know. But the reality is the same for her, right? She's still in that situation. It matters, the signer, and why she was in trouble? He wasn't there at the time of the notarization. If he had been there at the time of the notarization, she didn't realize the documents were fraudulent. They looked like business documents. She would not have been in trouble if he had been there at the time of the notarization. That would have saved her. The, the reason Huge. for that result, that the notary wouldn't have liability, is that the law everywhere, in every state and territory in the United States, the law, it's common law, it's not in the statute, but the common law cases say that if notaries exercise reasonable care, if they exercise reasonable care to carry out their legal obligations when they notarize, if perchance uh, something happens, if an imposter um, outwitted them, for example, if you, if you attempt to reasonably identify uh, the uh, signer of a document and yet the signer is imposter, uh, you didn't know it, Nevertheless, do the notarization, that notary who uh, notarizes for an imposter av after having used reasonable care to do so will not have legal liability. 
So Kelsey's point is, is valid everywhere. That notary would have been protected. And of course, the, the other situation I assume that happens so often in the employment is that it's not necessarily the boss who doesn't show up uh, to, to sign a document he or she wants to have notarized, but the boss says to the notary, this is a good client, let's not inconvenience that client and make him or her show up uh, for the notarization. Uh, we know the signature and so on. Uh, the boss will suggest a, a shortcut of some kind or preferential treatment uh, for a valued uh, customer and ask the notary to violate the notary statute. Notaries have got to be careful uh, about that. They just can't let that happen. And that is, again, where these contentious discussions can happen. Let's try and get out ahead of them because the, that's the hardest part, right? The contentious discussion. Let's try and avoid those if we can. Um, another thing you want to do is, I can't stress enough, even if your state statute does not require you to keep a journal, I am begging you to keep a journal for every notarization you perform. Every state allows you to. Not every state requires you to. Here's another one where if you haven't done that before and your boss is going to be like, oh my God, it's going to add time to my life. And <laughs> you know what? Get over it. <laughs> this is what I need to do to protect us both. And that's what it is. And I am telling you that journal in many, many cases is your lead underwear. What is your proof that the person was there at the time of the notarization? If their signature is in your journal, not on the document, when you journal it and says, this date, this time, here it is, there's the signature. The journal almost always can be admissible in court as strong, if not the strongest evidence, that this happened. Well, and, and that's the point that is my favorite about the journal. Uh, it's one thing for a notary, if there's a lawsuit or a disciplinary action, the, the state notary agency uh, files a disciplinary charge against a, a notary perhaps. If that notary comes before a judge and jury or before state regulators and simply testifies uh, that, oh, I'm a careful notary, oh, I always do it right, I'm thorough, I'm diligent, and so on, that's self-serving testimony, right, from the individual. And uh, can that always be believed? Uh, not necessarily, but if there's a journal with the, the written evidence in that journal that the notary took all of these steps that are described in the journal, uh, that's almost proof positive. Uh, that's in writing, that's objective, and most importantly of all is this. A lot of people think that when you do a journal entry for a particular notarization, that all you're doing is protecting yourself for that notarization and helping to validate that single notarization. That is not the case. If you're ever in a lawsuit or before a disciplinary body, they're going to look at your whole journal, not just one entry. Pattern going... of behavior. That's right. Um, I did a, a suit in California a few years ago where I testified in a case involving a notary, and this notary had been a notary for several years. She had four or five full journals. She notarized almost every day. She had over 1,200 notarizations in four or five journals. The judge and jury got to see all of the journals. And in my testimony in the case, I got to talk about all of her journal entries, not just the one entry for the one notarization that was being challenged in that lawsuit. So if you keep a journal, you are building a record of your diligent performance. If you fill in every column, every page of that journal, day after day, year after year, that can be a blessing for you. That can be the best evidence ever that you have exercised reasonable care because you do it every time. So keep a journal. Keep a journal and keep it right. Because the other part about having a journal is, are they going to come to you tomorrow asking you a question about a notarization you did? No. While it's still fresh in your head? No. It'll probably be five years later. And they're going to ask you questions. Did you notarize this? 
Do you remember what it was? If you don't have a journal, that's going to be a very difficult thing to do. So in your journal, put in, there's a, usually a line that says, you know, additional information. Put whatever you want. Worst red tie I have ever seen. Guy smelled like garlic from three feet away. Whatever. It's your journal, right? It's about what will key you to remember things going on. Anything that happened. If it was a giraffe and you put them under oath, you physically did put them under oath, write it in the journal. Put them under oath. Not just for giraffe, but put it in there that you put them under oath. Because a lot of notaries don't know the difference between an acknowledgment and a giraffe. And that putting in a giraffe means they must put them under oath. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to stay right here in the notary law, or the, the notary uh, training, and understand the difference. Very important. Um, I, I think the, another way to make uh, the point that Kelsey is, uh, is to say, uh, don't feel bound by those lines and columns in a journal. There's nothing sacred about that. If, if you want to write more than, than is provided on a particular line for a journal entry, just do it. If it takes another line because you want to describe something unusual that went on, go ahead and use more space. And her point about putting something in there to remind you of that particular notarization is terribly important. Uh, think about it. When you perform a notarization, you're doing it because there's nothing unusual, nothing suspicious about it. It's pretty ordinary or else you wouldn't do the notarization, right? You would refuse it. So people tend to forget these routine things when you do something that you approve. So years, like months, but usually, Kelsey is right, years, and sometimes many years, you should keep these journals forever, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. Five years isn't enough, 10 years. Uh, in, in the most recent case in which I testified in court um, uh, as an expert on a notary dispute, it was 10 years almost to the day that I testified from the time that the notarization occurred. Let me say that again. Notarization occurred one day. Over the years, uh, the, a problem was discovered with that notarization. A lawsuit was filed, and you know how the law moves very slowly. Almost 10 years to the day later, I finally was testifying in the trial of that lawsuit. So who can remember things for 10 years, right? It's, it's terribly important to keep these journals uh, for a long, long time. If I can put in one plug in uh, the new book that's out. Oh, you're only going to put in one? Because I'm going to uh, put in a few. 15 reasons in the chapter on journals. There are 15 separate reasons that you ought to keep a notary journal. We've mentioned only two or three of them. 15 reasons are in here. Uh, it's the best thing you can ever do for yourself. Keep those journals forever. Sometimes your states will say, well, when you've decided you're not going to be a notary anymore, right? You think you're done and maybe you're going to retire. Or maybe you just don't want to do it anymore. You change jobs and it's not going to be part of what you do and you don't want to do it anymore. And they say, well, turn your journal into the state. Okay. I've lived in the same house for almost 30 years. One time I went to get my driver's license renewed and they fat fingered my zip code. Same zip code I'd been at, but now it said something different. Do you know what it took to get them to rechange my zip code back on my driver's license? Like six months and three visits to the DMV. But I'm supposed to believe that if I need that journal back, if I send it to the state and I need that journal back to protect myself, that they're gonna be able to come up with it? I wouldn't believe that if I were you. I'm just saying. Send them a copy. You can send them a copy of every page in that journal if they really feel the need. Although I will admit to you that most people probably don't send it in, in the first place. But if you really want to do it right, send them a copy. But keep that journal and keep it forever. I'm going to keep it in my savings deposit box forever. And when I'm dead, my heirs can throw them in a pit in the backyard and light them on fire and dance naked in front of it for all I care. But then, and only then we're done. Or, or send the state the original and you keep the, the copy. It doesn't matter. The important thing is you ought to keep a copy and you ought to keep it forever, forever until you pass. So journals are important, but having a compliant journal, 
is important. I get notaries. We bring in, you know, when we buy other companies, right? We'll have people that come in that have been notaries at other places. They have seven or eight pieces of paper folded over with a staple in the middle. That's their journal. That is not a compliant, legally compliant journal. It has to be permanently bound, pre-printed, numbered pages. Okay? These are the things that make a compliant journal. Get it from a reputable place, not just a local office goods store. Get it from the NNA, get it from the NLI, but get a compliant journal. That's important too. Now, whose uh, journal we, is it? Just I one have, second. I, I, uh, oh, okay. okay, give me okay. one second. Okay. Whose journal is it? Your company buys it. They paid for it. Good for you. So when you leave the office, you're going to leave it with them, right? In our state, it is a little different. Um, it depends on the type of mobilization. True. There are some states that, that can ask to keep a journal. So keep two. Yeah, if it's, you know. Or you get to keep a copy of it, yeah. right? There is a state. Very good, though. There is some states where the employers can keep a journal. Understand if you're one of those states, I think there's only two. And it's only for work notarizations, not right. for personal. Right, that's the other so, thing. But you are able to keep two journals, and you are able, although I don't recommend it, but you are able to keep copies. Make a photocopy. Make a photocopy and keep that photocopy. But for the rest of the people, that journal stays with you. If an employer says, no, 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 you have to leave that here, no, 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 I do not. You take it with you. If they, com if they continue to, to cause an issue about it, then you call your state or your governing body and say, they want to keep my journal. And guess what? Then the state comes in and says, why are you keeping notary journals? Let's have a look at that. Let's think that over. And pretty soon, <laughs> you're going to cause a lot of attention to something maybe they didn't realize. Keep in mind, most of the time, employers are not doing it for some nefarious reason, right? They just don't know any better. If before you had any notary training, did you know any better? If the notaries don't know what they're supposed to be doing, how can the employers? So it's not that they're trying to be obnoxious. They just don't understand the difference. So compliant journal, keep it yours, mine. Doesn't matter who bought it, OK? And keep it secured. Don't put it in the office supply cabinet. You laugh. I have seen this. I'm going to write a book. Won't be as good as his book, which, by the way, don't put your stamp in your boss's desk. I've seen it. Don't be like me, or when I've seen people, I go to my, I go to my notaries. I say, can I see your stamp in your journal? What I'm asking for is that they have it secured and in their possession. They're like, yeah, it's right here, right on my desk. That's why I have hair dye all the time. No, keep it your personal, right? Let, let's tell them why. The why is because uh, if you leave that seal out and around and available, somebody may steal it and, or damage it, destroy it, or worse, somebody may misuse it. Somebody, we, we see it all the time, forged notarizations. Someone will take that seal, they will put it on a document, they will sign your name, forging your name, and suddenly you have a forged notarization. Lawyers even do this. You, you know how they are. Uh, a lawyer's <laughs> uh, clerk or, or secretary will be out to lunch and the lawyer thinks he or she needs this right away. They'll take uh, the seal and, and they'll seal it and sign the paralegal or clerk's uh, name to um, a certificate, and suddenly you have a forged notarization. So uh, protect the security of the seal and journal. Um, journals sometimes disappear or pages get ripped out of them because if you do what Kelsey has said and buy a bound journal, the reason we want them bound and the reason that you're required to put the, the entries in chronological order is so that no one can tamper and either remove individual entries or insert 
individual entries that shouldn't be there. Um, so protect both of those items. Um, I, I've got, uh, earlier you mentioned NLI, mm -hmm. and um, I might let that slip, except that we have one of the owners of NLI in the room. Oh. NLI is the Notary Law Institute. The Notary Law Institute, the American Society of Notaries, the National Notary Association, they all publish notary journals that are very well done. You can purchase them. Uh, the NNAs is here. You can purchase the others uh, through them directly or online. Uh, Richard Burton is in the uh, audience. And in the house. A, a co-owner, uh, a friend of ours. And so um, there Where you know about you? NLI. Just make sure it's compliant. Get it from an ethical source. The same with your stamps. Don't go to Staples and get your stamps necessarily. And I don't mean to disparage staples, except for the fact that sometimes large office supply places will, it's the same stamp everywhere. But if you read your notary statutes, sometimes they're very specific about your stamp. They want it to be circular, or they want it to be square, and no more than this many centimeters, and blah, 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 and this on here, and that on there. And sometimes large office supply places just give you the stamp everywhere you go. So make sure that you go someplace that will actually give you a compliance stamp as well. Get your supplies from a reputable place. It will save you in the long run. And the last thing I was just going to mention about uh, journals is you don't share them. You know, if you have several notaries as an employer, a lot of times the employer says, well, they're all for us. You can just share a notary journal. Okay, seriously, how cheap are you? <laughs> no. One per person, you keep them under your control. And if you move cubes, don't put them in the thing where the facilities people are going to move your stuff. Do you want to know how many journals I've seen lost because they did that? No, oh, that's not in your control. Keep it with you. Now, whew, I can't wait till we get to some point that we do have a contention about. Bottom line is, I think it's a, ethically if an employer is going to ask you to perform notarizations, in other words, they are going to use your personal commission for their benefit, they should provide you with the tools and the training that you need to do it right, to save you both. That's another conversation to have with employers that we can start and talk about having that, in, that conversation about building a program. I've been brought in for many companies that want to build a program, and how do you start that, and how do you begin the conversation? I'm, the easiest way to do that now, this book. This is the book I've been waiting for for a very long time. So your employer says, well, what's the big deal? All you have to do is you know, stamp it, right? Sign it and stamp it. You see this? This is what it takes to do proper notarizations. Stop that on his desk. Does it look like you're just stamping and <laughs> signing my name? This is finally a, a guide to what it really is about to be a proper notary. All the complexity, all the legalities, all of the things that it really makes a difference. This is a wonderful tool you now have to take to your employers and go, hmm, maybe just isn't as simple as we thought. And maybe we should think about this in terms of a broader prospect, right? So yeah. I am begging you, if you don't have one of these books, please pick one of them up. Pick I them didn't up for ask friends. her to do this. Uh, he this did is, not, uh, but I on, warned uh, him that I was going to tell him, because this is really important. If, if we go on to what the yep. employers can do, we've, we've got several points about what employers can do. It's not that they must do it, although, as Kelsey has said, if, if they have you serving for them in order to benefit the company, they certainly ought to consider doing such things as paying the costs for the employee to become a notary, including the costs of the commission application, registration fees, buying the official seal, the official notary journal, they ought to send you to notary training, and they ought to pay for it and give you time off from uh, the job, and bonds and liability insurance. Uh, purchasing the bond and paying the premium for liability insurance is another discussion that you ought to have if the company does not have a policy that covers you for uh, notary malpractice 
and protects the company as well, by the way. If it's done right, uh, the company ought to have a single policy that covers you and any other notaries and in addition then uh, protects the company uh, through insurance. So the company can do these things, again, uh, to emphasize the point, just because they pay for the seal and journal doesn't mean it belongs to the company. It belongs to you because you're the notary. The, the, the more important uh, ones, the more controversial issues uh, are the next two or three. Uh, the company can prohibit employees from performing notarizations while on the job, while at the workplace, um, while in the employment, or in law we call it within the scope of employment. When you are at work, the company can say you may not perform any notarizations. Even though you're a public servant and, and some people think that that uh, implicates the notion of being available to perform your service activity, still, if you're an employee and doing notarizations there, you can cause liability for the employer. And that's why employers have the right to tell you not to do any notarizations while you are on the job in order to protect the company against potential liability. The other thing the company can do that numbers of businesses do is this top one. The company can limit notary employees to performing notarizations just for company business, company documents, as opposed to customer documents, as opposed to documents for fellow employees of the company. So it is also an option for employers, if they want to, uh, to limit your performance to just company-related documents. And again, why? It's probably because the, the company doesn't want liability for those other things. There's almost no risk to the company in having you performing notarizations of their documents. The only risk is to the company. At least there's not a risk uh, to outsiders at, at that point. Now, so, just a note, there yeah. are all kinds of variations of this, and they can all be okay. Some notary, some, a lot of times I get people to start programs in their, their companies, and they almost go too far. Nope, no notarizations unless it's, you know, for company business and under any circumstances. I don't control it that hard in my program because, but I will say we don't allow our approved notaries while on company property and while on company time to do deeds, uh, anything to do with transfer of property or wills. Why? Because they're some of the most litigious and contentious documents, right? So I'm going to try and avoid that. But in general, I don't want to supervise that so much, right? You are a public official. And I don't want to get into the situation where I will only notarize for people who are blue, right? I don't, that's not okay to say, right? You're a public ministerial officer of the state, right? So sometimes they can allow it. But the other part of that is then you get to say no too. If somebody comes to you and wants a notarization done and it's 15 different notarizations in this huge packet of stuff and it's 4.30 on a Friday and you've got an appointment, you get to say, right? They say you're supposed to take any lawful and reasonable requests. Well, is that reasonable? I have a deadline coming up. I have a job I've got to complete. Can I perform this notarization for you? That's not necessarily then a reasonable request. Make an appointment with me. Come back next Tuesday at 3, and then I can take care of this for you. You get to choose that. So keep in mind, then, you also get to say no, even if it's a business thing. If, they're, if the employer is doing this ethically, they should allow you to say no, even if it's an employee request. I, I want to make sure that I'm understanding something here um, because I too have encountered this with, uh, uh, with cases I've been involved in. Um, it seems to me that an employer should either say no to any notarizations or say no to uh, anything other than company-related documents. If the company even says the only exception is we'll let you do uh, wills for employee or wills for um, uh, uh, employees or customers. The, the problem with that is that as soon as they open that door, if that notary mistakenly thinks that he or she is doing a will and it turns out to be uh, some uh, pension funds transfer instead, suddenly the company's going to have liability for that. 
So would you agree with me that the company probably should do either a flat prohibition or a prohibition of anything other than company documents because if they open the door at all to anything else, they may get pulled in um, uh, against their wishes. And, and, and that is the and, risk. Well, and, and, uh, and, and this will help clarify it. If the company says uh, you can um, only do uh, wills in addition to uh, the other company stuff, if the notary makes a mistake, that's not uh, a defense to the company. The company says, it can't say, oh, we didn't want our notaries doing that uh, at that point. Uh, that mistake by the notary is going to haunt the company. Mm -hmm. would, would you agree? Yes, absolutely. So that's where you run into, you know, you go back and forth for the risk, right? And it's a, you have to consider this terms in terms of what the risk is, right? But a lot of companies want notaries available to their employees, yeah. especially their large customers. ones. Yeah. Yeah. Customers, let's, let's put that for a different section, right? Okay. Because we determine between employees and customers, right? So if there's a lot of employees that just have minor notarizations, it's great to have somebody on site. We always say to them, look, these are the notaries. They have the right to say no to any personal notarization they want. So call them up. If they're willing to do it, they think they can do it appropriately, we'll be okay with that. But not if it's a will or any kind of a financial transfer of, of property. Now, could, like he said, could that be a mistake that happens? Yes, it could. But we have chosen to accept that responsibility if that were to happen. But we also monitor our notaries pretty carefully. I check every journal for all 453 current notaries, which I know sounds crazy, but what we do is a journal check for the last three used pages twice a year. But we're looking for things that look like documents that were going to be a problem. So we're trying, and we, we train all of our notaries ahead of time and to explain the difference, right? If you're not in that situation, it's better to go completely no than it is to go a little bit back and forth. But you have to make that determination based on what you guys, the employee, uh, or the employer does. What is your business? What are the risks? What do you take on, right? Clients are a completely different matter. Again, as I said, if you're in an advisor office, for instance, you get the clients in, they're all doing estate documents. That's what we do, financial planning. Those documents have serious risks and complications. So we have to be very careful about what we allow our notaries to do there. So think that through in terms of one size really doesn't fit all for all employers. So you really have to think carefully about what you do, what your company generally notarizes, the kinds of things that happen. Same thing with the liability insurance, which is one of our things that we don't always agree on. Companies, most of them have business insurance. If you're not doing a lot of you know, things, like I don't train my Florida notaries. I must have 150 notaries in Florida, minimum at any given time. I'm not training them on how to do marriage, marriage ceremonies. <laughs> Doesn't happen in the corporate office all that often. What I am training them to do is the things that they're most likely to run up against in their normal course of business because that's where I'm most concerned about. I also don't teach them how to do depositions, which most states have give you the notary power to do a deposition if you're a notary. We don't do that because we have very specifically trained notaries and paralegals that do depositions. We're not asking our notaries in general to do depositions, so I don't train for that. I train them on acknowledgments, jurats, copy certifications, the things that they are most likely to find in their day if they're an employee notary. Beyond those scope of powers, I tell them go get some other training if you're going to want to do that outside of the corporate office. So one size doesn't fit all. You'll do better getting a program set up with your employer if you take into account the actual risks that your employer faces. And, and we are going to talk, uh, assuming we get to it, we're yeah, going to talk, uh, we're yeah, we going to talk about uh, liability insurance. Real quickly, this last point about what employers can do. Uh, employers cannot control notarizations. The notary controls the notarization. Uh, the employer controls the notary's other portions of his or her employment except that an employer, of course, can encourage and instruct notaries to perform correctly, 
lawfully, with diligence, honesty, prudence, reasonable care, and so on, and to obey the law. When employers want to get involved to encourage notaries to do the right thing, we don't want to discourage that, of course. We want employers to be doing that. But when they cross the line and attempt to get notaries to violate notary law, that's where they are unable to do so and should be unable to do so. The one problem is when we say that they can uh, encourage notaries to use reasonable care and to obey notary law, one big problem is most employers don't seem to know notary law. And so sometimes they will, in good faith, simply not know what the law is, and they will tell their notaries to do something that they think is correct when in fact it is not. That's Hopefully where the notaries that, need to help build the notary right. program. That's right. To help the employers wade through this. And what do you do when you're an employer like I am that does business in all 50 states? And every single one of those state statutes is different. We have to state on the best practices. We start training with best practices. In other words, the right ethical things to do with a notarization. Signers always there, those kinds of things. Then we move into the statutes. Because otherwise, you can't do one fits all programs that way. We do one program, and then we have a separate program for California because it's a completely different animal.